All right, everyone. I'm super excited. You can notice the new view, the new background. We're changing things up on the podcast. We're on episode 29 of the Conquer the Mind podcast. If you guys don't know, you should definitely know by now. If you can conquer the mind, you can conquer anything in this world. And I'm very excited for today's guest. I feel like it just aligns so much with like how I was so lost in life going through the academic system. So I'm very excited to have Jeff Hughes the founder, the president of Skill Samurai, which helps bridge the gap between young people's ambitions for college and really the specific skills that employers are looking for. So Jeff, thank you so much for joining me today on the Conquer the Mind podcast. It's my pleasure. I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. Well, typically, you know, the way the podcast, I kind of like diving into like the early background, you know, the early days of Jeff Hughes. I think for a lot of us, especially nowadays, we see, you know, a CEO, a president of an organization. And, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, things just happen a certain way for them to get there. But I know, you know, there's certain paths, certain directions, you know, it started with mindset, I'm sure. And then you took massive action along the way, probably faced a ton of obstacles as well. So I know there's a lot of people out there, whether in corporate America or they're in college, just trying to figure out what that why is, what that mission, what that purpose is. And I think, Jeff, just going through your career, you're someone that definitely knows what their why statement is, what their mission is. So I'm super excited to kind of dive into that. But to kind of start off, you know, before you even, before you were even in the world of franchising, you were actually an independent business owner, from what I understand. So very different. I know a lot of people that I speak to on the phone are always comparing, do I want to do this by myself or do I want to get into a franchise system? So I'd love to start off with kind of like the early career of Jeff Hughes. How did you, you know, get into, from what I understand, is diesel pizza and wings? And my understanding is that you're actually a top three pizza chef in Canada, or am I making that yeah. up? <laughs> yeah, no, that is true. So what happened, um, as it often happens, we were uh, leaving a job. My wife was nine months pregnant, uh, mm -hmm. and my degrees are really kind of, irrelevant out in out in the working world uh mm -hmm. so i i wanted to start a business i wanted at the time just to uh, build a business that would allow me to just have some personal freedom i didn't like the idea of always being kind of stuck working for someone else but also that would often make me feel like i was i was unable to earn more money or there were just things that i couldn't do so like a lot of people, when they think of owning their own business or franchising, they think of food. Mm -hmm. So I had been focused actually on a cafe and that didn't come together, but um, an opportunity came up to buy a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a mistake in lots of ways, but I tell people that that was my starter business. That was my, uh, my business degree because I hadn't taken any business classes. So Again, my wife had just had a baby three months earlier. We moved halfway across the country, bought a house, bought a restaurant and jumped in, renovated it over a weekend, rebranded it. Um, and in retrospect, it would have been better to take take a bit of time and just come and uh, live off the savings and find a job. But I, I just wanted to jump in with that. Mm. Um, and I learned a lot. There was a lot again, a lot of mistakes made while running a business when I had no idea about how to do that. Yeah. And what often happens, the whole idea of the e-myth is that someone uh, starts a business and they end up buying a job. And mm. I realized very quickly that that's what I had. I had a, a very expensive job that was paying me less than minimum wage and was you know, a job that I probably wouldn't have wanted when I was in high school. Mm. So I had, um, you know, I, I went from doing the things I like, which was developing the brand and doing the marketing to being in the kitchen at 11 o'clock on a Friday night. So I, I sold that. Um, and from there, my vision, even with having a restaurant was that I wanted to have a franchisable business, mm. which set up, um, well, which kind of dictated how I was going to set up my business and how I was going to run it and how I wanted to test it. Mm -hmm. So I am on the East coast of Canada, not really a hotbed of franchises, mm -hmm. but 
there was one franchising company out here. They have just over a hundred franchises and some of their employees were customers at our restaurant. Okay. So a position became available for a franchise coach and trainer. Mm-hmm. And I went after that job hard because I needed to learn about franchising. Mm-hmm. So I ended up getting that job and spent almost two years working in a franchise company, knowing how to train and onboard and coach and manage um, franchisees. Mm-hmm. And then when I uh, left that company, they helped mentor me in starting this company. But, um, you know, kind of the impetus for what I'm doing now was ironically being unemployed. Um, I, as I mentioned, my degrees were not great for uh, high paying careers, but Mm -hmm. so I started to teach myself computer programming. Okay. And I realized quickly that, um, I wasn't smart enough for that. I'm not a precise enough person. Uh, But during that process, I realized that nobody was teaching our kids those things. Mm -hmm. And this would have been the fall of uh, 2014. And other countries like Estonia had just released a comprehensive computer science curriculum from kindergarten through high school. Mm -hmm. And my kid's school at the time had three computers for 350 kids. (laughs) And I thought, how how are they going to be prepared for these jobs? How are they going to be able to compete for jobs in the future when they don't even have access to the technology? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really powerful. And I love how just going through your career, you know, I feel like a lot of people when they get into business ownership, it's at a time where they hopefully don't have a ton of risk to hedge. And it sounds like, you know, right. you're in a relationship, you're starting to figure things out. You know, you have a lot of risk at, at the moment. It's not like you have kind of like that cushion to fall back on. Was it kind of like just like a lack of opportunity that led you to business ownership? Or was there like a calling even like while you were in college that like you wanted to be a business owner? I know you kind of said your degrees weren't totally helpful towards like the path you wanted right. to go. Yeah. I Looking back, when I was a teenager, I tried setting up some businesses okay. uh, like T-shirt printing and things like that. Uh, But I really didn't have anyone in my life who was directing me. Um, Mm. And I wish that someone had said when I was 15 or 16, hey, you should maybe look into uh, business or being an entrepreneur. And if that had happened, I probably would have taken, gone to school for business back then. Uh, But I just, um, I really just didn't have that. So part of, you know, what drives a lot of people into business is the lifestyle that they want to create. Mm. So I I knew what I wanted for my life. I knew that I wanted to be able to help people and do, um, you know, build orphanages and support orphans and Mm. do lots of things. And to do that, I knew that I wouldn't be able to have uh, like a traditional salary. So Mm. when when you start with your vision for your life, and that can be well, I want to have freedom to be around my kids when they have any event or an appointment. I want to be able to do what I want kind of when I want, and I want to be able to support other people. Then you can begin with that and say, all right, now how can I create a business that will allow me to do that? Mm. So I had written probably eight or nine full business plans uh, before this one. And Mm -hmm. I would get to the point where I just realized, all right, this isn't going to work financially or it is. So Mm -hmm. I was really motivated by the lifestyle I wanted to create and by, you know, coming to a realization at 39, 40 years old, that the things that made me a poor employee were really Mm -hmm. because I was trying to be an entrepreneur within other people's organizations. And Mm -hmm. that is just a, a recipe for conflict because you're trying to recreate things and you're trying to set the vision when really you have no place to do that because there's already a visionary leader at the top of the organization. Mm. No. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. I know I've heard on like previous episodes, typically a business, you know, you have the CEO, the founder, who's kind of like the visionary. And then you kind of have those entrepreneurs that are more like the integrators building out the system. But 
when you have a lot of visionaries at the top, you know, it can be very easy to butt heads. And, you know, just as a solo entrepreneur in corporate America for a couple of years, I can totally relate to exactly what you're saying. You know, I want to do things differently. I want to do things my way. And, you know, you're continually feel like you're outworking the CEO, the founder. You want to do things. You know, you have that motivation. You want to get things done. So it can be tough while you're in corporate America as an entrepreneur right. to try to figure out that path. And then even in business ownership, you know, it's not for everyone. It's not an easy path. It comes with a lot of obstacles. You know, if it were easy, you know, everyone would be a business owner reaping the benefits. So I think that's a really good point. If someone is in corporate America, whether it's franchising, independent business ownership, where there's some of the things that while you were in corporate America, where you're like, all right, I'm, I'm not necessarily meant for this. So like, someone else watching this episode, maybe they're in corporate America or trying to figure out mm -hmm. well, maybe they've considered business ownership, but how do they actually get that confidence that this is something worth investing some of their time to explore? Right. <clears throat> There's two ways. One, you know, obviously franchising is a great shortcut mm -hmm. uh, to accelerating being an entrepreneur, but maybe, maybe someone has an idea and it's not really, maybe it's just an idea for a business and they're not sure if it's going to work. What I did when I started, I had um, no money. So you first need to find a way to create a business and test and validate your idea without having any cash. Mm. So there are so many tools today that you can use to do that. I set up a website on WordPress. You can learn WordPress you know, this weekend and have a pretty decent website or Wix or anything. Have a website up and running. And then I created some forms. Uh, so we started with summer camps because that was something I understood from my previous business, how to run a summer camp. And we created these kind of STEM and computer programming based camps. Mm -hmm. I did not have staff, curriculum, locations. I just had an idea that I wanted to validate. So mm -hmm. I created the registration forms, uh, created a Facebook page, so far, everything's free. And then I ran some paid ads to mm. see if anyone would sign up for the camps. Mm. And within uh, that first month, all the camps sold out in three different cities. Wow. Then I had to, in one case, I had to write the parents and say, hey, great news. We sold out the camps. I don't have any location to hold the camps. So if any of you have any ideas, let me know. And within minutes someone wrote me and had found a spot for me to hold the camps that they had already paid for so with that and with pre-selling i was able to start my start right at the beginning in three different cities hmm. and then the next summer we expanded to six cities and i did the same thing i would create a new sub page on the website and advertise in that city and if there was interest great if there wasn't, I wouldn't hire staff. I wouldn't rent a space. Um, so, yeah, validating your idea. Do not spend much money on it. I talked to someone last two weeks ago. They have a concept that they want to create. Mm -hmm. And that's great. They had already bought um, a Mercedes Sprinter van. Okay. They were already decking it out. They were already talking to franchise lawyers they didn't even have a customer and they were already a hundred thousand dollars in the hole with an idea that i don't think is going to work and it wasn't my place to tell them that it wasn't on shark tank saying stop spending money but i really did feel that way like yeah. they want i guess i can say it's like a mobile waxing business so okay. um you know maybe there's a market for that i it's not a product for me but mm -hmm it seems like with almost any idea you can validate it by pre-selling before you before you start a business see if there's a customer who cares enough to buy it yeah no i, th I think that's a really good lesson and you know someone that's considering business ownership you know it's kind of like there's so many different steps between the product the marketing lead generation um pricing like you could go on and on with the different elements of a business but you know you're in corporate america trying to get over to business ownership you're trying to figure out what should i even do first but it sounds like from your perspective you should be kind of like testing things out in the market maybe doing like surveys 
getting a feel out in the market before you know you're making these huge investments to really build out the infrastructure. Am I right mm-hmm. there? Yeah, and then I I use that money from those pre sales to um, form my business, pay for okay. insurance, buy equipment, hire staff. So this this business that is now we're in seven countries started with no money out of mm. our own pocket because I had already lost all of our savings on the pizza restaurant. Oh, um, so there was really no, there was no cash in the bank to do anything. Mm. So you, if you have a job, if you are in a spot where you are just wanting to try something else, you can really, you know, whatever day it is by the, by the end of this weekend, you can have a website up. So Google forms, Facebook ads, uh, and see, and even just beginning with conversations, I my first step was going and talking to some other dads and saying, hey, I've noticed this problem. Do you think people would pay for this? Mm. And talking to some people who hopefully you trust and they could say, you know what, I don't, I don't think so. But you're also going to talk to people. I, our city had um, a grant program. It was $25,000, so definitely would have been useful I yeah. pitched it to my concept to them. I already had customers and they just didn't understand, understand the importance of teaching kids coding. So mm-hmm. they didn't give us any money for it. So you're going to encounter people who do not understand your concept. Yeah. Uh, so it's hard to know if they're saying this is a bad idea because the concept is bad or because they wouldn't be your customer. Mm-hmm. And you can just say, all right, you know what? Conceptually, you don't get it, but I still think there's a market here. So speaking to a few different kind of advisors, uh, and a lot of cities would have a, an under tapped resource, which would be kind of like their small business development program. Mm-hmm. And my wife was looking at starting a business. They have so many free programs. She went in, sat in on, sat in on like a five day free course on starting a business. Uh, and they had just have advisors who that's their job just to tell people about starting businesses and to help them see if it's a good idea. So take advantage of as many free resources as you can. Even if you are looking at starting a franchise or buying a franchise, you should still be doing local market research and business planning before you pick which one you think will work. Uh, you might talk be talking with a franchise consultant who says, here's four different concepts that will help you meet the vision for your life. Mm -hmm. You should then be exploring and seeing if anyone in your town cares about the product that you are looking at selling. Mm -hmm. No, those are really great points, Jeff. And something I'm always speaking to candidates on the phone with as they're trying to evaluate all these different opportunities is would you or someone, you know, use that product or service? And if Mm -hmm. so, how often are you using that product or service? You know, is it a luxury good that, yeah, maybe my mother, my sister will buy it, but you know, right. is it kind of like just that one time purchase kind of like that luxury good, or is it something like education, dry cleaning, you know, a service that people continually need that has that recurring revenue built in so that you're not trying to continually sell a new product to new people, but you already have that good that there's probably mom and pops in that area. And now you can leverage the franchise resources, mm-hmm. vendors, relationships, into that town, into that local community. So I think that's a really, really great point, Jeff. And one of the things I'd be curious before really diving into Skill Samurai, because I'm very excited to dive into Skill Samurai. I think it's a really cool education opportunity. But you mentioned, you know, not having success with the pizza franchise. And I know one of your earlier goals, you think I said, you said in another podcast was that you always wanted to franchise. That was kind of like always the vision. Could you kind of walk us through, you know, someone, they maybe have a business, they're lo- looking to franchise that business model. Could you talk us through like what went wrong with the pizza business mm. compared to Skill Samurai and how you're able to, you know, you're already in six different countries at this point. So it's pretty impressive that you're able to scale internationally. So can you talk us through kind of what those differences are between being able to launch into a successful franchise? Yeah. Uh- some of it is just the food market in general, that something like mm-hmm. pizza is often a commodity that people will, they're just buying it because it's cheap and convenient. Mm-hmm. So a couple of things happened with it. Um, our pizza was very high end. 
Uh, and I was using a lot of technology that in this part of the country, they just weren't early adopters yet. So I was spending money on things that uh, people weren't ready for. And it sounds silly to say, but this was like 2008. So we had online ordering and uh, even coupons via Twitter. And people just didn't care because they weren't doing online ordering. They didn't, they weren't checking Twitter for those things. So yeah. those things were just kind of wasted. Hmm. The other problem was um, the, the financial crisis in 2008 um, did have an impact because we were selling a premium product to wealthy families. So hmm. instead of them buying it every week, they were buying it once a month. Um, and then the, the flip side of that is um, companies like Little Caesars came in with their $5 mm -hmm. hot and ready pizza, and they were selling their pizzas oftentimes for less than the cost of my ingredients. So mm -hmm. it became, when you're dealing with something like a commodity, um, people just want it cheap and fast. Mm -hmm. So I, it just became clear that even though it was a cool concept, um, there there had to be easier ways to make money than by working in working in a kitchen making pizza. Mm -hmm. um, so then again, with with the franchising goal, right when I opened, I was already testing it in three different cities, and then six, mm -hmm. and then fifteen. So if someone has a business and they're thinking, how is this a franchisable concept? the first step is almost always to test it in another market. So mm. if you are in city A, how can you test it in location B without uh, you being there? So many times a business runs, a successful small business runs successfully because of the personality and gifts of that owner. So they're the ones who are going out getting the sales and the contracts. Mm -hmm. And without them, there's no business. Right. So how can you train someone else to do the things that maybe you are naturally good at? Mm -hmm. So opening up a second location will force you to create the manuals and operating guides that are so important for a franchise mm -hmm. owner to have. Yeah. And then you can tweak some of those systems and see if it's working. If you get your idea up and running in two different cities uh, or even just two different locations, uh, then you are closer to a spot where you can say, all right, we can now maybe get someone to buy this, mm -hmm. to, to buy that concept. So that's that's a service we kind of we offer as well to help people franchise their idea. Um, but it is something that, again, Franchising is very expensive. The amount of money that they recommend you have to to launch a franchise is quite high. So make sure you don't just jump into that without experience of having multiple locations. Because as a franchisor, you are not running a local business. You are overseeing multiple locations. Of, um, so it's a different it's a different skill set and mindset. I talk to people all the time who say, hey, some, if you're running a good local business, people will come into you all the time and say, oh, you should franchise this without having any idea what that concept means. There's like, oh, what they mean is, hey, people love this here. You should try it in other spots. Mm -hmm. But it costs, you know, the creation of your franchise disclosure document could cost you $40,000. And then to mm. register that in every state is, you know, another $20,000. <laughs> and that doesn't include marketing or right. um, insurance, just so many other things that you need to do that. Yeah. So the, the, and not to discourage people from doing that, but just be financially prepared. If you want to franchise, they say to grow to 100 units, you need to have a budget of a million dollars. Um, so a lot of times a successful business owner will, will run into franchising without the support team and without the finances to do that, which is what I've done. Um, but I would not recommend that. And as I look to build another franchising company, 
uh, really want to make sure that I have the support, the infrastructure, and the the finances in place to do it well. Yeah, those are amazing points. And, you know, I just cannot emphasize enough, like the difference between a successful business and a successful franchise is literally like day and night. Like there's just so right. many differences. You can have like the most successful business in your local community, but it takes so much to turn that business into a franchise. I know you alluded to $40,000 just to build the franchise fee. You know, it's probably over a hundred thousand dollars just when you talk about mm -hmm. marketing and all those resources. And then when you talk about reaching the hundred unit level, which is kind of like the point where a lot of people are like, all right, this franchise made it, you know, a million right. dollars. Like those are massive, massive investments. So I think really good advice as a candidate, as you're looking to franchising as a potential opportunity, you know, you mentioned kind of the SOPs building the infrastructure, you know, it's really cool, especially if you're looking at an emerging brand as a candidate. You know, is it just the founder that's like leading the charge? You know, they probably they have a strong tie to the brand, to the mission. Are they running the whole the whole business or do they have those S&Ps in place, the infrastructure, the resources? So is it solely the founder or can that business function without the founder? I think it's just a really good point, and especially as you are looking to those other markets. Mm -hmm. You, know, you want to have that confidence in the franchise system that they've already built out the infrastructure of the systems for you to enact that playbook rather than looking to you to build out totally new systems in a whole new market. You know, they should have those SOPs for you. So Jeff, one kind of quick question for transitioning to skill samurai, you know, we kind of mentioned earlier kind of the opportunity with business ownership, kind of being the personal freedom and that untapped mm -hmm. income. You know, a lot of times when people look, towards starting their own business or getting into franchising, people say, you know, I'm making this big investment into a franchise. And then are they just going to keep selling other franchises to people around me? Will I be able to actually grow? Like, yes, they'll have that single unit. They can see that annual income, but do they actually have that uncapped income or are there going to be a bunch of franchise owners within the next couple mm -hmm. months right next door to them? And, you know, they can't necessarily reach that uncapped income, but how, when a candidate's evaluating a franchise, how do they make sure that they'll achieve that personal freedom and that uncapped income that so many people are looking for? Yeah. For a lot of, um, smaller businesses, um, mm -hmm. where a person maybe just by buying the franchise is replacing their income. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it does come back to their vision. Like, all right, do I want, am I looking to replace my income and have a job or am I looking to create an asset that I can sell or am I looking to build a large kind of empire that I can run? Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at um, one of the differences between an established brand and an emerging brand is some of that flexibility. So you might be able to talk to a small franchisor and say, I want to buy one or three or five, or I want to buy a master for the state. You can't always do that with, you know, you can't go to McDonald's and say you want to buy an entire territory, like mm -hmm. multiple territories. Um, so when you do that with a smaller location, a smaller franchisor, you can say, hey, I want to buy three or I want to buy five and secure my entire city. So there's definitely that option. The other thing is you want to make sure that uh, when you're reviewing the franchise agreement, that you have an exclusive territory, that they aren't going to sell within a certain radius of the business you're building, and that the franchisor isn't going to be able to do business within your territory either. Yeah. Um, there are, I, I wrote on X last week about a franchise that has you know, 16,000 locations, I think, but they're not exclusive. So I could buy one and start one. And then my next door neighbor could buy one and start one as well. So since you're going to be doing so much of an investment in your local marketing, you want to make sure that you are protecting that with an exclusive territory. If you are in a city that would support more than one territory, you really do want to have that conversation of, can I buy you know, what kind of price will you give me on this entire city of a million people or two million people? Right. Because there's there's so much um, cross marketing that's going to happen. If I'm marketing 
in areas that aren't in my territory, but they're still in a big city, then that might benefit a new owner who isn't doing any marketing, but they're just benefiting from the C the SEO work that I've been doing previously. Mm. Yeah, no, that I think that's really interesting as someone that's kind of thinking about all these different things in franchising. It can be very overwhelming from that outside perspective. Right. So I always tell candidates when they're looking at those newer brands, you know, the CEO, the CMO, the COO, do they have that franchise specific industry experience? Because if they were just a successful business and they transitioned to that franchise model, like I said earlier, it's really just day and night between those systems. So investing into the proper infrastructure, building those systems is very clear what Skill Samurai has done. So I really want to dive into Skill Samurai, sure. which I'm really excited for. You kind of alluded to earlier, you know, you saw your son's school, 300 kids, just three computers, and you're starting to see there's definitely a need for something or there's some error here. Could you kind of walk us through, you know, you are a business coach, you're starting to really dive into the franchising world, helping franchisees launch their business. How does this eventually lead into the transition of you launching Skill Samurai? Well, it was it was really uh, one and the same. So we did begin, as I said, with those coding camps the first summer. So 2015 was camps. But then that fall, we continued with after school programs in a bunch of neighborhood schools. Um, and it was probably by the third year where I was running programs in 15 different schools and probably 13 different cities across the country that I thought, all right, let's pull the trigger on franchising. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, my, my former bosses, they really mentored me in uh, the creation of the franchise documents, of the training, mm -hmm. um, of the coaching and operations. So they were really, really helpful. So, you know, it goes without saying, if you are going into franchising without experience, find a coach or find a business that will help you do that setup because there are so many ways that you can lose money. There are so many mistakes that you can make. Uh, so it's vital that you have someone who can coach you in that. Um, and then we, the differences are really in the products that we're offering. So we have gone through a few different names over the years, uh, but Skill Samurai is the best reflection of what we want to be doing. That, as you said, there's always going to be that gap between what schools can teach and what employers are looking for. So mm -hmm. formerly, our name had coding in it. We were focused on kids. Uh, with the a rise of AI last year, there are a lot of questions like, do people need to know coding? Mm -hmm. um, do people, uh, is this just child specific? Mm -hmm. So we can, having the name and the branding, we can teach lots of things. Last mm -hmm. fall, we offered started offering math. We are heavily investing in AI courses. Um, but as the that demand for skills change, so can our content. So mm -hmm. we are really an enrichment education company mm -hmm. um, focused on skills development, whatever those skills may be. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that just gives our owners some long-term viability. Uh, if coding isn't needed in five years, they're not stuck teaching uh, a dead dead course material. No, that's that's really powerful. And I definitely want to dive into that very shortly for just to kind of make it very clear for people that are watching. If someone knows absolutely nothing about Skill Samurai, they become a franchise owner. Could you walk us through those different ways of actually deriving revenue? You mentioned kind of the coding camps. Hmm. What are kind of like those other things that franchise owners can provide to that local community? Yeah, so we do uh, after school programs, weekend programs, teaching computer programming, math, uh, engineering, robotics. We also do more programs recently during the day in schools. So schools are having us come in and teach their computer science classes. Uh, mm -hmm. Often that begins with private schools who don't have the resources. We also run programs during the day with homeschool groups. Um, then we can offer things like birthday parties on weekends. 
uh, parents' nights out where the parents just drop their kids off and go on a date, and the kids are running program or doing programs in our centers. Um, we we used to say that anytime kids are out of school, we can offer programs. So on days even when teachers are doing professional development and the kids don't need to be um, at school, we can run programs. Uh, we are getting um, again more interest from adults looking to get to upskill or increase their skills for their jobs. So we're mm -hmm. pursuing that more. Um, but as it is right now, we we offer programs from um, pre pre K all the way through the end of high school, wow. and we are beginning to explore um, partnerships with places like daycares and after school centers where they are already running programs, but they don't have our type of program. Um, and our owners, they aren't just building a brick and mortar spot. We're really encouraging them to look beyond that traditional retail model. Hmm. So we are in YMCA's trampoline parks. Uh, I've been having talks with family entertainment centers. So imagine all these places with really high rents uh, yeah. and they're empty during the week, um, typically. So anywhere in your city that has an empty, empty party rooms are places that we could typically run our classes in Monday to Friday, um, generate revenue for a local owner, and then also get kind of a low cost rent for for our owners. Huh. That's awesome. And I think that's fascinating that you mentioned some adults are kind of showing interest as well. Cause that was one of the things as I've been kind of hearing more and more about skill samurai, it's like even adults need all these skills. Like the world is changing more and more. I feel like every single day you look up, there's a new um, word in the dictionary that says a previous word dot AI. So like right. whatever it may be, there's just a new word that incorporates AI somehow. So it's like, if adults aren't staying on top of this, we're just going to lose out to the next generation with those mm -hmm. future jobs. So I think that's just a really powerful point. And I really like that opportunity as well. And, you know, you've kind of mentioned a little bit about how you went about testing the concept and, you know, you're making sure that there is actual need for this service before, you know, you're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars. And now you have gotten that proof of concept here in other countries, but can you kind of walk us through as someone that is trying to figure out that proof of concept? You know, you played around with brick and mortar. You're also in like YMCA's. You can make it like a mobile version. How did you go about like figuring out like kind of like the flexibility and kind of giving franchisees like these different kind of participation models, way to get involved? Was this something that happened over 2020 and COVID where people are seeing kind of like these high rank costs or what was kind of like the transition from the brick and mortar flexibility or how do you kind of figure out all these different methods? Well, we really started with uh, what we call the mobile model. So mm -hmm. I would go to a different school every day, five days a week and just run after school programs at their, at their schools. So mm -hmm. that, that was really how we started. And then my summer camps, I would do them, I would rent the computer science labs at community colleges. So really at, at our heart was that lower cost startup and lower cost um, ongoing model. Yeah. A lot of, as, as costs rise, we're seeing rental rates that are just getting really too high to support, um, yeah. you know, an after school program. So yeah. if we can go to a YMCA or rent a party space, or we even have some owners in co-working spaces where you're just paying by the hour. Um, it makes a lot more sense. You know, some of our rental rates we're seeing, we're being quoted like $8,000 and that's just too high um, okay. for a kid's program that runs from four till eight. So mm -hmm. if we could be in a place where we're just paying rent from four to eight, then it, it makes a lot more sense. So COVID did have a, a role to play in that just by driving up so many costs. Hmm. No, that's really awesome. And I think just another thing as, you know, Canada is evaluating different franchise opportunities. You know, how is that franchising making more investments into the growth of future franchisees? And, you know, it's very clear as you're kind of talking about Skill Samurai is constantly investing into new resources, innovations to 
not only support the franchisees, but the franchisees and their business supporting the next generation of students, which I think is just so powerful because you talk about franchising, combining the passion with the profit, like just mm -hmm. does not seem like a better way to influence the next generation of people that are going to cause that next, the next generation of growth in this country. And I think growing up, you know, I have a lot of, you know, you listen to like parents growing up and they complain about the next generation, you know, they're lazy, they're unmotivated, kind of like this and that, but it's like, what is that generation doing to prepare that next generation? Right. And that's what I love so much about Skill Samurai, Jeff. Like, you're not just complaining about the next generation. You're you're actually figuring out how to make changes with that next generation. Can I kind of like? Can I ask Jeff? I'm so so big on like the podcast and finding what someone's why statement is. My idea is that life really doesn't start till you figure out your why. You know, I went mm -hmm. 21 years of my life without a why statement, and I was just so lost. You know, you can throw in the words like depressed, bipolar, or whatever it may be. Just overall, just didn't know what my purpose was and just kind of going through the motions. Hard to figure out that why, but it seems like you have a very clear why statement. Can you, can you tell me or the viewers that are trying to find their why statement? And going back to the earlier podcast, whether you're in college, high school, or 30 years in corporate America, I think 90% of people don't know what their why, their mission statement is. Can you talk to us, how did you go about forming that mission, that why statement, and why is that so important to you? Yeah, so going back through, I turned 40, I guess like a decade ago, I'll turn 50 in October. When I was 40, I was unemployed for like the third time mm. uh, living out here. And I was, I didn't celebrate my 40th birthday. I want to have this big party, but I was unemployed. I didn't have any job prospects. Uh, and I really did not know like how to how to see my vision come together or how to really go into something besides being an employee. Yeah. So um, my my vision has at, at its very core, my vision is taking care of my family mm -hmm. and making sure that my kids are having great lives. Uh, and that mm. comes from just kind of my upbringing and all the things that I did not have. And I'm not just talking like, um, like stuff. I really want them to have a certain uh, lifestyle and uh, be able to do things. So last mm. summer, my wife and my girls were at uh, an orphanage for a month. Um, next month, my son is going to Hawaii and he's going to be part of a team doing um, education and medical relief throughout the Polynesian islands. Wow. Um, last year as a business, we built an orphanage. Um, every month we support uh, 30 something kids in Kenya. So for me, um, a business, as I said, is just a way to support the things that I've wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I had a, a dream of building an orphanage there's no way I could ever get enough money at my job to do that. Mm. So I created a business that allowed me to do that. Mm. Um, but so those things are all kind of like core concepts to me. But what yeah. I love doing is helping people fulfill their dreams. So mm. talking with someone else about a business that they want to start or even helping them on their business concepts and coaching them is what really excites me. Mm. So um what i love doing is just helping people realize and understand their their vision for their life yeah. um, and i get to do that through franchising i get to do that as a consultant now i get to do that i just started last week as a professor at a university and i am creating an entire four-year business program um, wow. so i get to do that thing that i love which is helping other people um with their business visions uh, at multiple levels. So those are really the exciting things that um, I've always liked help, having people, helping people brainstorm, but now I get to kind of do that professionally. Um, so it has been a long time coming. The last decade has been great in building my own business mm -hmm. and now starting more. Um, but yeah, it, it took a long time. I spent my twenties and thirties feeling like I was lazy and not good at working. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kept losing jobs, as I said, because I was butting heads.
but yeah. really I was just in the wrong, the wrong field. I wasn't mm-hmm. supposed to be uh, an employee. I was supposed to be working for myself and learning how to do that. So I can mm-hmm. look back and see how everything got me here. I wish I had jumped a couple of those steps earlier. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, that old adage of it's never too late to start is really true. Mm -hmm. Um, no matter what age you're at, what you've done, how much of a failure you feel like you can still find your why you can still, uh, create a business or even work for someone and be happy and build the life that you want. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm Jeff. I'm fired up. That was awesome. It is a Monday morning. I'm so excited to attack this week. I just like, Totally. I just love everything you just said. I think it just aligns so much. And I just think it's so powerful to impact the next generation because those are the people that are going to continually impact this country. So equipping them with the skills to take their Mm -hmm. career to that next level is just so powerful. Because like I said with me, I was just so lost going through high school, college, just no idea what I want to do. And you know, just based upon what you said, I have so many different questions, kind of big picture questions, but <laughs> I love to stick with Skill Samurai, kind of building off this topic. So one of the things for me personally, I think I kind of mentioned it to you previously, is for me, I was actually in first grade. My teachers told my parents, they called my parents and said, I have a learning disability. They said, he doesn't understand numbers. He can't read anything. My parents sent me to a program called Kumon by <laughs> third grade. I knew math better than anyone in my grade, you know, they would do like the timetables tricks and I was first every single time. Like I took it so competitively. So the point being is that school system doesn't necessarily equip us with the skills, but everyone learns at a different rate. You know, for me, I needed kind of like that personal one-to-one guidance rather than being in a room of 30 different people with, you know, a lot of different distractions. Can you talk to me about how skills Samurai kind of adapts their programs to, people that learn at different rates, people that may not be able to learn in, you know, groups of 50 different people, but how do you kind of tailor your programs to actually help those individual students, if that makes sense? Yeah, because of the amount of content we have, we are really the only STEM or coding company that can offer personalized learning for every student. Mm -hmm. So we have parents who come and say, my kid wants to, do Minecraft, then they want to do robotics and engineering, we can bring them through that every three months based on their interest or based on what uh, the parents want. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most, if, you know, 95% of the courses are self-directed. So they are, the students are learning at their own pace based on the things that are interested, interesting to them. And our, our, the adults in the room, we call them coaches. And that's really what they do. They are walking around the room, coaching and encouraging the students and helping them if they're stuck. But there's very little kind of upfront traditional classroom teaching that happens. It is more driven by the student's interest. So if they want to be learning about 3D printing, then they can do that. When they're done learning about 3D printing, if they want to uh, program robots, they can do that. It really comes from um from their desires uh Mm. more than us creating a set path for them we have set paths um, but more often the kids kind of choose their own adventure through our courses Mm. no that's really powerful and i know just doing my research you guys have over 40 years of content kind of built up and yeah i know i think the competitors have about like eight weeks worth of content so it's kind of just like day and night with how you guys are continually building out this new content But when we kind of talk about entrepreneurship, one of the big keys is innovation, developing. And you kind of mentioned you have coding camps. Now you're kind of leaning towards AI, but you have over 150 different courses. You can kind of like tailor this to the student's interest, which I think is so powerful. But can you talk to us about like the ongoing research and development that your team has? Or how are you figuring out out of these 150 courses? Like, how do you figure out these are the courses you want to um, give to the students? How do you go about adding future courses? How do you kind of figure out what that next stage of the student's growth could be? Yeah, that's a good question. We we follow trends and kind of the market demand, so what people are looking for. And then we still pre-sell. So we had uh, 
some things that we have marketed never never came about because there wasn't a market for it. So virtual reality is still something that companies are trying to push. Um, so we offered some virtual reality camps. Nobody signed up that we didn't offer them. Uh, same with drones. Uh, drone racing, I thought would be really cool. I might've been the only one because parents didn't sign up for it. So we still follow that philosophy of, you know, we'll advertise camps in November and December um, and see if people want to buy it. Mm -hmm. And we evaluate our content every year. Uh, we are always uh, looking to build new partnerships. I just got off a call right before this one um, with a company in Shanghai who's building an AI curriculum. So <clears throat> we are always looking to build partnerships and have conversations with people who are doing things that we aren't doing yet. Mm -hmm. And that's how we can uh, stay on the cutting edge. Uh, and that comes from having, having your vision set. So my vision was to be a franchising company, not yeah. a curriculum company. Mm -hmm. So we license our curriculum at the moment from seven or eight different countries and have it all in our catalog. Some of my friends who started at the same time developing their own curriculum, they still have one course and they still have one location um, and they're still using that curriculum from 10 years ago. Mm. So it, it really came from, um, from having that clear goal of what I wanted to build, which was a franchising company. Mm. No, that's really powerful, Jeff. And I'd be curious, it's kind of like the long-term vision, you know, you guys are, obviously at like the forefront of the industry, the most courses, the most content, you know, most personalized to people's interests is the long-term goals to kind of still be like a complement to public private schools. Do you want to like completely like overtake the public private mm -hmm. school sector? Or how do you kind of see like skill samurai in the long-term, like playing out into the academic system? Yeah, that's that's a good question. During the pandemic, we had I had actually started like a virtual private school. Okay. Um, and there are some states where it's easier to set up a private school. So it's something we've toyed with. Um, and we've talked with other partners about uh, college credits and career certification courses. Yeah. So those things are all definitely on the table. Um, and even for, you know, at the elementary age, there isn't really much of a demand for um, certified courses or course credits. That's more at the high school level. Okay. Um, so it is something that's always at the back of our mind. Like, is this something we need to be doing? Uh, mm -hmm. We're not we're not there yet from a demand standpoint. Yeah. Um, but it is something that we're constantly evaluating. Um, what is the content that students need what's the best way to deliver it what's the way to make it most attractive to parents um yeah we it's um constantly things that we're talking about and we will have to bring more of it kind of in-house from a curriculum development side especially mm -hmm. as we you know look at ai there aren't a lot of companies that are building kids ai curriculum right. um i'm in talks with someone in vietnam right now while I'm on this podcast, they're texting me, asking me questions. Um, so we will kind of outpace what the traditional content that we're currently using. Mm -hmm. uh, so as we get into those those areas, we're going to have to be um, hiring content and curriculum developers. And we're kind of there now with the need to do that. Um, so we'll see, see what that looks like because um, mm -hmm. no one is really doing it yet. Yeah. No, it, this is so exciting, Jeff. I know the hour's winding down now and I could probably go for another five hours with questions. This was awesome. And I'm so fired up for this week. One of my kind of final questions for you is for me personally, you know, going through really up until like 21, just felt like I was so behind in life. I just didn't feel like the skills I was learning necessarily, you know, I did internships in college and I was realizing the stuff I was learning wasn't helping me with my internships mm -hmm. and it, it just slowly destroyed my confidence to a point mm -hmm. where I was 20, 21 and 
literally had no confidence. And that's when you're supposed to be graduating with a fancy business degree. And you start, you're supposed to feel like, you know, you know, right. you're supposed to have figured life out. You know, that was my expectation and could not be further from the truth. You literally had no idea what I wanted to do in life. But it wasn't really until that point where I started consciously taking control of my life and doing things outside of the public, private, college, school sector, mm. but learning courses. You know, I kind of say I had a full YouTube crash course education with mentors that don't even know who I am, but I consider them a mentor because it's once you want to do things consciously, start to learn on yourself all these skills. I feel like that's when I started to build the confidence that, yes, I could do this. I could do that. And so I would be curious with Skill Samurai, you know, you're really equipping people with the skills to be successful. But not only that, it really comes with some of these softer skills, like building their confidence, figuring out what their interests are. I think that's so powerful. But can you talk about like the importance of Skill Samurai helping build kids' confidence so that, you know, when they are about to graduate, they do have the confidence that they can do things in this real world? Yeah, that's that's a big, a big, um, big concept as well. So, okay. as kids are learning, we are encouraging them to be developing things like resilience and leadership, problem solving, mm -hmm. gratefulness. Um, yeah. So we we try to be encouraging students to do that and call it out when we see them helping someone else. Uh, so that they are seeing the need for those things and hopefully developing them. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about confidence, what some people say, oh, it's silly to be teaching a five-year-old programming. <laughs> but 85% of jobs that will exist in 2030 don't exist yet. Wow. So how can we prepare kids, even adults, for these jobs when they don't exist? And in my mind, the best way we can do that is by giving them confidence. So they can say, you know what, I've already learned these languages. I've already done these activities. So I can learn a new thing without being afraid of it. And that's a big part of what we do. So we spark their interest in learning. We give them the confidence so that no matter what comes next, they can be willing to learn it and be willing to try it. Mm -hmm. um, and learning resilience will help them when things go wrong or they don't learn things as easily as they hope to, or they just make mistakes. Coding is nothing but a, a bunch of mistakes that you have to debug and figure out until the program works. Mm -hmm. So those skills are so critical in the development of people mm -hmm. of strong moral character, but also yeah. people who have uh, commitment and resilience. Resilience and problem solving are probably the two things that I want our students to learn and walk away with. Mm -hmm. So if they're stuck, they can figure it out. And when they face setbacks, they can um, keep pushing forward. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, Jeff. I think that's a great way to kind of sum up the podcast episode. I know it's kind of sure. If you have to run right now, definitely run. I like to kind of sum up the podcast very briefly for the viewers, sure. if that's okay. Of course. Um, but I'm so excited. This was a lot of fun. I think some of my like big takeaways from the episode and one of the points you just talked about is how it, there's so many jobs that people don't even know about yet that are going to be created over the next couple of years. And I feel like with society, we always look at the negatives. It's like, what are those truck drivers going to do? What are those people in X industry going to do that's going to be overtaken? But it's like, well, we have the answers for you. You know, you just got to start right. to take control of your own future rather than kind of letting society dictate that future for you. And I think it just comes down to consciously taking control of your future with the name of the podcast, conquer the mind. You know, if you want to be successful in life, society is not going to necessarily equip you with those skills to be successful. It's what are you going to make out of this life? And I think it really starts with that why statement. And I thought it was really, I like how you were very open, you know, you're 40 years old, you're unemployed for the third time. And you had no job prospects. And I was literally talking to someone at the gym today who's 21 years old. He just got laid off in finance and he was just so disappointed. And I could relate to him. I didn't get laid off, but it, just figuring out what that point is in finance. He was very much like me. He's an entrepreneur trying to figure out what is that mission, that purpose, and just trying to figure out 
whether you're 20, 21, you know, you don't need to have it all figured out. You just need to continually take action, take these steps, and then you'll start to figure out what that mission is, what that why statement is. Um, and I think your why statement is just so powerful. So some of the big points for me is just in business ownership, the personal freedom, having that uncapped income, it really is up to you and what you want to make of this future, whether you know you want to buy a single unit or to replace your income, or you want to be that empire building. And you know, I just released a podcast with Charles Kaiser, who started off with one little Caesars location. Now he owns 38 locations. Mm -hmm. And now he's actually starting a franchise business as well. So it really is just like, don't look at that annual income in a franchise opportunity, but look at, they're going to equip you with those skills to take your career to that next point. And I just like your point so much of just empowering that next generation rather than trying to kick the next generation down, if you will, but lifting that generation up, making that difference. Like there really is nothing better you can do than to give the next generation the confidence, the skills that they can be successful in. That's something why I started the podcast, why I'm a franchise consultant, why I have a marketing agency. It's to help other people with all these skills because I was so lost for 20, 21 years of my life. Mm -hmm. And now I feel like I have it figured out, but I'm still learning from, you know, people like yourself on this podcast episode. I have two full pages of notes just mm -hmm. from today. So I'm excited to take this into my life as well. So if you made it to the end of the episode, everyone, like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, check out the website in the bio. If you're interested in Skill Samurai and really equipping that next generation, combining the passion with the profit, definitely shoot us a message. I appreciate you tuning in. Jeff, I really appreciate your time today. I, oh, nice. I really resonated with your mission, your why, and I'm excited. Thank you. Yeah, it was great being here. I look forward to more conversations with you. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in.